I thought there was an element of risk in pinning my hopes that we'd get Neil Armstrong to do this. So when we eventually caught up, it really was amazing. I knew something a lot of people didn't know about Neil Armstrong, and that was his dad was an auditor. So I think for people who are leaders and for people who aspire to be leaders, listening to Neil Armstrong is far better than doing any educational MBA program that exists in the world today. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Neil Armstrong, a very warm welcome to Australia. Thank you so much. The words determination and destiny keep coming to me and, and the way in which your life's unfolded, I'm not quite sure of the order of those at times, but certainly your first air show at two years old, your dad took you to, yeah. your, your first aeroplane flight with your dad at seven and your pilot's licence at 15 tells me a lot about determination. Yeah, I had... Uh become fascinated with the world of flight as, a, as, a, as an elementary school student and uh, determined that uh, somehow I wanted to be involved in that. And, and as I uh, learned uh, more about aviation, I thought design, that that would be the epitome of, a, of an aeronautical career to be a designer. And uh, so that's what, I, that's what I strove for. And in terms of um, your, mu your mum and dad, Stephen and Viola, uh, your dad was a public servant in Ohio and uh, travelled a lot in his role. What, what, what did your parents collectively teach you and give you as a foundation? Well, they, uh, my, my father was an auditor and uh, he audited the uh, books of uh, county governments or, or across the state where we lived, uh, the state of Ohio. And... Uh, so we we were a transient group. My father moved the family along with him as he moved around the state while we were young, and uh, and uh, I think they they were very accommodating. They allowed me to do uh, pursue my own interests, and uh, and I'm forever grateful that they uh, gave me that freedom. They didn't try to dictate to me what what I should do or where I should go. And your childhood, what, what fascinates me about it is, and we've had these conversations before, about your rather heightened fear of death as a child and, and concern that if a pet died you didn't really want to confront it, yeah. is not necessarily what would appear to be the man who would take all the risks he took in adult life. I mean, that was, that's quite a fascinating... Well, uh, I, I, I think uh, many younger people are uncomfortable with the thought of death, uh, whether it be themselves, their relatives, or their pets. Mm. And, uh, and I've shared that, that uneasiness about uh, facing the reality of death. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it took me uh, some years to, uh, to s sort of circumvent that, uh, mm. that concern. So then, of course, Neil, you, you, went, uh, you flew 78 missions um, in the Korean War and, again, took some chances. What are your reflections on the risks you had to, to bear, you and your colleagues? The risks in combat are substantial, and I, and I think, in general, they are higher risks than uh, I faced in my uh, test pilot work or in my astronaut work. Uh, and the consequences are, are severe. Uh, and uh, there, there's a, 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 a good side and a bad side. The bad side is that uh, you lose colleagues, and, uh, and, and that's painful. Uh, good side is you, have, you create very strong bonds with yes. the, the with your colleagues that uh, that survive, mm. and those uh, those bonds exist throughout your lifetime, and uh, and I I value those experiences very highly because they uh, they build a lot of character, they build a lot of backbone, and you are a better person for having uh, having learned to endure those that that environment, that situation, yes. and those risks. So, Neil, your test pilot career um, was 
uh, uh, you know, as everything else in your career, a distinguished one. But tell me what a test pilot feels and, and, and what it does feel like to get in those jets as you did so often, the exhilaration, the moment, the responsibility. The, the test pilot is solving problems. He's looking for inadequacies or shortcomings or uh, barriers to uh, substantial safety and increasing performance in, in flight. And his job is to uh, identify those problems and assist in finding a solution. Mm -hmm. So it's a problem solving job. And uh, you're always working with the unknowns. And I found that a, uh, a fascinating part, part of my uh, career path. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to contribute in some way to uh, the solution of problems. The history of humanity has been you know, slowly increasing the, the, the boundaries of knowledge and knowing more and more and more and feel comfortable inside there, but at the edges, it's always going to be a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to those edges, your, your first flight, um, one of your first flights in your B-29. Now, being an accountant, I can do the numbers. And if one engine out of four is working, I'd be worried. And that's without any pilot experience. Mm -hmm. um, what happened that day? And how did, how did yes, you work we, through the problems? Uh, you know, I was a pilot of uh, one of the two pilots of the B-29 carrying a rocket out uh, aircraft to altitude where we release the airplane and it would go doing the testing and we were just providing the service to get, get the rocket airplane up to a starting point. Uh, and we were somewhere up above uh, 30,000 feet when the governor on one of the propellers failed and the uh, propeller started running away, that is going faster and faster and faster. And of course at some point in time it's going to uh, explode. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had the choice of either slowing down to try to slow down the propeller or speeding up so that we could drop the rocket. Uh, we chose the latter, dropped the rocket and almost instantaneously, instantaneously thereafter the propeller exploded and blades cut through the, it was the right, far right engine, cut through the number three engine, cut through the fuselage and the number two engine, and left only the, the num number one engine running. Uh, that's uh, an uncomfortable position, <laughs> uh, one out of four. But fortunately we had a lot of altitude and uh, we had a big dry lake bed not too far away where we, where we could land so we could make a very gentle, very, make very gentle turns and mm -hmm. uh, keep the power back and uh, sort of make a gliding approach into the uh, landing area. Now, the, the, the second pilot, so his control cables had been cut by the propeller, so he, his controls were of, of no use whatever. I, I still had control, so I was flying the uh, airplane and he was doing the thinking. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and when we got to the ground and looked at the airplane uh, afterwards, we found that my cables had been cut too, but there were still a few strands of the cable left. So we were very fortunate uh, to, uh, to have survived that situation. Extraordinary. And look, another example, I guess, was in the, the lunar training when you had to eject mm -hmm. from the rocket within seconds of your life, as I understand it. Um, take us through that. Uh, well, um, we, uh, we needed something to uh, simulate landing on the moon. The moon has no atmosphere, so you're flying in a vacuum, and the gravity is much lower. Right. So the characteristics of a flying machine in that environment are very different than they are here on Earth. And we felt we had to understand those variations and be able to feel comfortable in flying the lunar module to, uh, in, to the surface of the moon in, in the actual conditions. So this device uh, did, did provide very good training and, uh, and experience in that mode. Uh, unfortunately, it was a complicated machine with a lot of uh, different rockets and wires and claptrap of all this, and uh, it consequently was subject to uh, malfunction. And uh, one of those malfunctions snapped on me one day, and I lost my control system. And uh, you know pretty quickly that uh, it's it's time to go and part company with with your friend. And uh, I did that, and. Uh, 
it, the ejection seat worked very well, fortunately, and, uh, and I bit my tongue, but that was the only real damage. <laughs> And, and, and as I understand it, as the legend goes, and you know that's a term I like using when I speak with you, you, you basically just went back to work. Well, yeah, there was work to be done at, back at the office, and so I thought I'd better go get, get, get on with it. I, I'm trying to line that up with the modern era of occupational health and safety, and uh, <laughs> it's just not working for me at the moment, yeah, Neil. That's, yeah. that's extraordinary. We've got some footage that we, I want to play to you uh, uh, that John F. Kennedy was speaking about the mission and about the vision. This was early in the 60s. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. The extraordinary time in the US at that time, you had the president of that ilk, you had politics, um, the administration, science, the community, all on song for this vision, all on song for that plan. What, what was that like? Well, you have to appreciate the context. The Soviet Union had successfully uh, put uh, first a uh, artificial satellite into space and secondly put a man into orbit around the Earth. Uh, we were trailing. Uh, we had put only one flight, Alan Shepard, on a short 20-minute suborbital flight up to about 100 miles altitude and back down into the ocean. Never had a person in orbit. And now the president was challenging us to go to the moon. The gap between 20 minutes, a 20-minute up and down flight, and going to the moon was something that was almost beyond belief, technically. But NASA was a new organization, only about four years old at that point, had done a lot of thinking about this. And they identified the lunar landing as perhaps the only way we could catch up with the Soviet Union. And as the president said, uh, we, we, were gonna, we were gonna get in this game. He was saying, this is, this is a new ocean around it. This is the new ocean and we must sail upon it and we must be a leader on it. And that caught people's imagination because at that time uh, we had the uh, ideological competition uh, between East and, and West and uh, concerns about the future of, uh, of all humanity on, on Earth. So it was a very big thing, not just technically, it was uh, sociologically a very big thing and the challenge was enormous. So to be able to get the, the agreement of, uh, of, the, of not only the, the government but the will of the people to go along with that idea was quite striking. Pardon my, my crude summaries but Someone sketching out all the Apollo missions in advance, saying, well, if we're going to get there, it's going to take this many, many missions. And you knew you were involved in the missions. You didn't know fundamentally at that point who was going to ever be the person to walk on the moon, if ever. And how fluid was that, was that plan? It was, it was very, uh, very fluid. Mm -hmm. First, uh, the first Apollo spacecraft was on a, uh, a pre-flight test with the crew in the, in the module, atop the rocket, on the pad at Kennedy Space Center. But then, what, it was Cape Canaveral. The cockpit was pressurized to at one atmosphere with pure oxygen, a little over, and a spark ignited some of the flammable material in the cockpit, the, the hatch uh, was an inward opening hatch that the crew was unable to quickly open and the crew was, was killed in the fire. It was a tragedy. Mm. 
and it was going to take us a long time to recover from that. We clearly had an unsafe spacecraft. We had to redesign it and rebuild it, and it was a two-year delay. Now, there were only four years left to the end of the decade at that point, so it's, it's take, we're losing half of the time in the race, race to the moon. But there was a, there was a benefit. Uh, every, every advantage is accompanied by a disadvantage, and every disadvantage, there's a, every cloud has a silver lining. So we were looking for the silver lining. The silver lining we got was that we, were ab we had two years to re improve the spacecraft, not just the fire resistance, but a lot of other things in the system that really needed improvement. So we could attack those and make a gigantic improvement in the quality of the spacecraft design and its construction. All the flights uh, changed somewhat during the evolution of those yes. flight periods. The, uh, the second flight, uh, after, the f after the first flight, to, was an 11-day flight to uh, make sure that the command module uh, had systems that would run for the length of a lunar mission. So they flew 11 days. And uh, that worked well. And the next flight was going to have a a uh, c command module and also a lunar landing module on it. But the lunar landing module uh, was behind schedule and it wasn't ready for a flight in 1968. So a very bold decision. They decided they would take the next flight on a third flight of the big Saturn rocket. The first two had been unmanned and not, not perfect, but, but a few problems that they worked out. Not only take the third one, and fly it with Yupins on it, but take it around the moon. An enormously bold decision. Mm. But that moved our program along a lot further because now we knew we could navigate to prove that we could navigate to the moon, that we could communicate at lunar distance, and that they they could they that crew could take pictures of the potential landing sites and see what uh, what might, might be a good plan for future flights. It's extraordinary to hear all this and to know how short a period of time this knowledge growth was taking place. Oh, it was multiplying yeah. like, uh, like mushrooms, yeah. I mean, I'm surprised you ever got to sleep. <laughs> so so what, 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 yeah, what happened then? I mean, so how long before you knew that the likelihood or the team knew the likelihood that Eleven was going to do was going to be the, the land and water? Well, uh, I, was, uh, I was the alternate or backup commander for the flight around the moon, Apollo 8. Right. And as soon as they took off, I was out of job, of course. And uh, the boss called me in a few days later and said, would you take the third flight down the, down the road, uh, 11? Mm -hmm. No, eight was in the air, nine was in the hangar yet, it hasn't it had started to fly, and 10 was, uh, the lunar module had not flown. Uh, there was no way we could predict what each of those flights would do. It was going to depend on the success and the accomplishments of each, each flight along the build-up period. But Apollo 8 worked well, 9 worked well, 10 did far better than expected, took a lunar module actually around the moon and, and tried out its propulsion systems and its navigation systems and communicating with two spacecraft simultaneously. All these things were accomplished in just those four flights. And uh, so a month before the, uh, the launch of Apollo 11, my, my, uh, my cruise flight, uh, we decided we were going to, we were confident enough that we could try an attempt uh, on, on a descent to the surface. And uh, I should say that uh, I thought uh, we had a 90% chance of getting back safely to Earth on that flight, but only a 50-50 chance of making a successful landing on the first, first attempt. There's so many unknowns in that descending from lunar orbit down to the surface yes. that had not been demonstrated yes. yet by testing, and uh, there was a big chance that some, we didn't understand something in there properly and we had to abort and, and come back to Earth without landing. It's a risk-reward uh, equation. And uh, you're able to accept a level of risk so long as it's commensurate with the reward that you will get by achieving the goal that you're after. Absolutely. And uh, that's, kind of the, that's kind of the balance you always make. Did you ever allow yourself 
the luxury and, and for the time I've known you, I suspect you're going to say no, but did you ever allow yourself the luxury somewhere between eight and 11 of dreaming of the fact that you guys may be the team that actually does the deed? Um, no, I can't say that I did. I told you uh, we, we, were, we, were, we were focused on, on progress and yes. making, making those incremental steps, thousands of little incremental steps that got you closer. Yes. And uh, we're looking for success in those steps and not focusing on that end goal too much. So there's the phone call. Neil, it's 11. You're the commander. Your reaction at that point? Well, you know, I, I was uh, I, I was asked by uh, the bosses, uh, are, do you think y you and your guys are ready? Are, are you, are, is there anything that you're really concerned about that you, you don't think we understand well enough that you, we can't go on? And so I was involved in those discussions. And, and, and I have to say, well, uh, you know, it'd be nice to have another month <laughs> But we were in a race here, and uh, there was some, some evidence that things were going on among our, our competitors, and we, we had to take the opportunity we had it. And I had to say, no, we're, we're ready. We are ready to go. Let's go to some footage, because this, this of course, is the launch uh, where all of this emotional journey you took the world on. Breakfast. Medical examination. Suiting up. Neil Armstrong, Commander Apollo 11. Edwin Buzz Aldrin, Lunar Module Pilot. Michael Collins, Command Module Pilot. The vehicle starting to pressurize as far as the propellant tanks are concerned. And an automatic sequence as the master computer supervises the third stage completely pressurized. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. A from the Apollo 11 liftoff. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. What I saw in that footage was three, and perhaps I'm, I'm getting to an age where everyone looks young too, but I saw three young boys really who'd done so much work and who were taping up and getting ready for the adventure of their and the world's life. Can you, can you recall any of your thoughts at that time as you were preparing? Was it, was it all about the preparation? Mm -hmm. Did the emotions well, playing a, up? It's a, it's a time of uh, meditation and a yeah. time when you're, when you're focused uh, on what you're really good, trying to do, but at the same time, there's a, a certain amount of uh, relaxed atmosphere. And the reason is, these rockets usually don't go off on time. <laughs> and, and, uh, Neil, and, I was um, really excited up to this point. <laughs> so, you, so, you, so you're thinking, well, we'll get down to two minutes and then they'll, <laughs> they'll call a hold and then they'll cancel the flight and we'll go another day. So don't get too excited here about, about this one. So there was, there was a sort of a, a, a built-in, look, this, we're, we're doing our best. It's likely not to happen. So we'll look the part and see what happens. And, and you're always surprised when, when it actually lights and you, and you go. <laughs> So tell me, in relation to the noise of all that's going on, particularly from from ground to the next yeah. to the next hit, what sort of noise are we talking about? Oh, the the noise at at liftoff uh, from from the pad is ex extremely loud, and uh, you get not only the noise of the engine but the reflected noise that's coming up off the ground, and so consequently, for until you fly out of that reflection after about 30 seconds, you it's very difficult to hear anything. 
even with our special helmets and earphones and, and so on. But after you get out of the ref, uh, out of the reflected sound, it gets pretty reasonable. A very shaky ride in the in that particular rocket, the Saturn V. Saturn V was a uh, three three thousand ton uh, machine, and uh, it's uh, that's uh, with an energy uh, enough to uh, more than that to lift you off the pad. It's uh, it's an environment that's uh, that's interesting. Very shaky ride in the early part of the launch uh, through the first stage. This the second and third stages are just as smooth as the first stage is uh, shaky. In terms of layman meets Neil Armstrong, which is this moment for me, what happens on a, give me, give me an idea of what happens on sleep patterns. Is there such a thing? Sleeping? Sleeping? Yes. Uh, we had a, a question in our own mind. We have this complicated uh, spacecraft to operate. Uh, are we going to have somebody awake all the time to run all the switches? What we would like to have done is sleep simultaneously and just put the craft on autopilot. And uh, that would be most efficient, uh, we mm -hmm. thought. And uh, we, uh, the problem is that if, you, if we all want to sleep and then the spacecraft drifted off attitude somehow and lost antenna lock with Earth, they wouldn't be able to communicate to us that we had a problem if anyone came up. So uh, we said, how, how can we solve that problem? We talked about uh, the, the concept with the, com with the computer guys and the simulator guys. And they thought maybe we could spin stabilize the craft like a rifle bullet and it would stay on, on path and we'd have the antenna pointed right back down toward Earth and the question was, well, would it last us eight hours while we were sleeping? Could, could it be done? They duplicated in the, in, the, in the simulator and determined that, in fact, you could spin stabilize it for eight hours, and you wouldn't have to spin it very fast. Very, very slowly would be enough to keep it on attitude, and we could keep contact for emergency contact with, with Earth. And it worked. So that's what we did. We slept simultaneously and then we could operate full efficiency for the other two-thirds of the day. And in terms of the, the camaraderie that you build on, on a mission like that, not just that you're on a mission to the moon, but the, the nature of it, uh, you're all still alive and well, and that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. there, there must be something about lunar travel that's good for longevity, I'm thinking. <laughs> well, I hope that's true. Uh, uh, we, we were a congenial bunch, uh, but uh, really focused on the job. You, uh, we really could not afford the luxury no. of diverting our attention away from our primary responsibilities because problems usually occur when you least expect them. Yes. And you can't get complacent. You have to keep paying attention. And we were very determined to keep paying attention. Yeah. So, Neil, it's, it's coming time to, to land. And as that process begins, you've got a computer malfunction telling you there's something wrong. What, what's the process you followed at that point? Yes, the, uh, the de lunar descent from lunar orbit down to the surface is, is uh, a very complex part of, of the overall flight uh, with a lot of things happening simultaneously and, and uh, not a lot of time to consider ab abnormalities when they arise. Uh, in the middle of uh, the descent, uh, we, our computer did complain at us that was, it was having a problem, but it didn't admit responsibility. Uh, uh, so, Sounds uh, like a modern computer. The, uh, I, I have to admit, I, I didn't understand the nature of this particular alarm. Uh, we had a lot, the computer had a lot of kind of complaints, but I didn't know them all. This one, this one was unusual. And uh, we asked uh, Mission Control on, on Earth to help us solve the problem, and uh, they didn't take very long to say, uh, you're cleared to continue. Uh, 
uh, that it was, uh, it was an overload problem in the computer, but the central part of the computer that was doing our calculations of, of our position and our navigation was working properly, and that was good news. So we continued on to the, toward the landing site, but uh, then the computer showed us where it intended to land, and it, uh, it was a very bad location. It was on the, on the side of a uh, large crater, about, uh, oh, I, I suppose, uh, 100, and 100 or 150 meters uh, in diameter, and with very steep sl slopes covered with very large boulders, and not a good place to land at all. So I, I took over manually and flew it like a helicopter, uh, out to the west uh, a direction, he got into a smoother area with not so many rocks, found a, found a, a level area and uh, was able to get it down there safely before we ran out of fuel. Yeah, within what, 20 seconds? Or Something 40 like seconds? 20 seconds of fuel left. Uh, it's almost like you were planning to do it, prepare a movie here because everything was just on the edge of everything. Yeah. So the, the crafts landed. Is there a moment where the three of you at least momentarily acknowledge that moment? Is, is that... Indeed. We took a... It was a handshake. Uh, you really went to town, a, didn't you? A, a, a <laughs> congratulations. We made it this far. Yeah. But uh, there was a lot of work to do at mm. that point, and we couldn't uh, luxuriate in no. those feelings. And including getting home. Yeah, exactly. Well, at the moment, we didn't... Well, we concerned that because the lunar surface is so warm, it's over... It's, it's over the boiling point of water, uh, and uh, substantially. And so the heat, the heat of the surface could affect fluids in the, in the uh, systems of the lunar module adversely. We had to be very cognizant of potential thermal problems that might be in existence, and if it was going to get worse, we were going to have to take off immediately and get out of there. Uh, but uh, that worked out pretty well. There were these concerns, but uh, they, they seemed to be working out satisfactorily, so we agreed that we could stay up, stay on the surface uh, a bit longer. But we were going to keep, keep an eye on it for the first several hours. And, and your words, uh, people have professed as to why those words and whatever else. So were you, as you were coming closer into land, were they coming to mind? Oh, they... no, I didn't, I didn't think about that until after landing. I, they had no confidence in our ability to get down, down safely yet, mm. so uh, it wasn't, I didn't bother thinking about, about that until after landing. And, and uh, of course, the, f the first statement we made was, uh, the eagle has landed. Yes. Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed. And that, that, was the, that was the signature line for achieving the presidential goal that we had uh, working, been working for a, a decade on. And, and in, in our view, that was, uh, that was a very important statement. The getting down on that was less important in our, in our view, but uh, uh, it, it was significant. Now, if you actually touch your boot into the, into the sand and Absolutely. recognize that it's, uh, it's uh, okay to, to stand there. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. So you, you, you now then went and did the famous walk to plant the flag, but also to um, respect those that had been before and attempting to reach the moon and had been involved in the process. Tell us about that. Yeah, we, uh, we, we recognised that uh, uh, we wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been for our competitors. Yeah. Uh, in the Soviet Union. It was actually the competition that made both of our programs uh, able to do the things that they achieved. And so uh, we recognized that by putting some medallions for our fallen comrades on both sides who uh, had not lived to see the event. And, uh, and that, w that was a tender moment. I was going to say, there must be such an emotional moment because even in the time I've known you, Neil, as, as, as much as that was competitive, there's such an element of decency in you as a person. And to actually be on the moon and to say, but by the grace of God, I'm the one who did it. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that moment where you probably wanted a little privacy, but other than the 400 plus million that were watching, you had that moment. It must be something that you have re reflected on over the years. Uh, it was... Uh... It was special, 
and memorable, but it was only instantaneous because yes. there was work to do. Yeah. And the, you know, the checklists were all over us. We needed to get on with things. And, yeah. uh, and that's why we were there. We, we were there, there to meditate. We were there to, to get things done. Sure. And so we got on with it. Yeah. And so you, you, you went back to the craft, and it's then that I think you heard that there was a phone call for you. Mm-hmm. I, I, I am well, surprised. Well, they didn't say phone call. They, they said there's a, something special here. OK. Yeah. I forget what they Trying to modernise the story, but I'm, yeah. I'm wrong on that. So you, you've come back, and it's, it's known to you that there's someone to speak to. Yeah. Um, and you didn't say, look, I'm busy at the moment. You did take the call. <laughs> I did take and, the and call. And who was that? And it was the President of the United States who was speaking from his office in the White House. And uh, a, a very, a very nice congratulatory message uh, uh, from from the president on behalf of, uh, of everyone who had worked on the on the project, and uh, and that that was a, a surprise, a very pleasant surprise, and uh, and. Uh, Again, yeah. there was work to be done, That's so right. get back to job. That's right. And so, to to the to the lift off to return, an issue with the ignition that required some rudimentary innovation. Yeah, uh, uh, my uh, uh, when when you're in this in the spacesuit and, and it's pressurized, it's very cumbersome. You're the like the Frankenstein monster, and you have this big backpack. Back and if you turn, that backpack is swinging around, and uh, and my colleague in one of these motions banged into the circuit breaker panel with his backpack, and uh, and there's a lot of a uh, lot, lot of circuit breakers over there, lots of ones, and so he could have picked something that was not very important, but he banged into the circuit breaker that controlled the SN engine that got us back in, in into orbit. Uh, I think that. Uh, that when we recognized that, we thought uh, it, it probably will hold, but uh, maybe we better see if there's a way to increase our chances of, uh, of, of making sure the circuit breaker wouldn't automatically disengage. Yes. So we took a piece of a, of a uh, plastic pen, uh, a magic marker kind of pen, and uh, made a made a little crutch to hold it in place with that. I think if they'd asked any of the 400 plus million that were watching that they're just about to insert part of a pen to ensure they get home, they wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> they wouldn't have believed it. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I really think that had we not done that, we'd still been yes. all right. But uh, it was just insurance. It's nice to get a little insurance now. Yeah. On landing, of course, there was celebration that to a great extent I don't think's ever stopped. And ever since that time, there have been people who have claimed that that, that never happened. And imagine that, after all of, all of the effort and all the passion, that there are still people that would say that. What was your initial response to that when I, when I talked to you? You said something fascinating about the number of people that were involved in that project. Well, I, I don't recall what I said, but people love conspiracy theories. Yeah. I mean, they are very attractive. Uh, but uh, it was never a concern to me because I know that uh, one day uh, somebody's going to go fly back up there and pick up that camera I left. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that'll be sure that. Mm. Well, look, I, I recall, and I think it was a fantastic response, uh, and that was because I'm, I'm, I'm hanging off every word you say, Neely, see, I remember. And, and it was around about the fact that. 800,000 staff at NASA couldn't possibly keep a secret. <laughs> that's that's and, right. <laughs> and knowing how people work, I think that's so compelling, yep. I can't yep. tell you. But in that conversation as well, you, you alerted me to the fact that someone has put together the most marvellous combination of your landing against Google Moon mapping, yeah. which side by side uh, clearly endorses not only that, but every crater, the flag, there's been no property development, we've just uh, decided when we looked at the footage. <laughs> it's opportunity. But, yeah. <laughs> so let's just have a quick look at it. This slide shows the trajectory 
to the surface. The actual power descent of the lunar module to the surface took 12 minutes and 32 seconds. And this is just the final three minutes, the part that's really interesting as you get close to the surface of the moon. Now, in the left screen, you will see the original 1969 movie film that we took from the window of the lunar module Eagle. And on the right side, you will see what the crew saw looking out the window in front of them. Now, there is a, a shaded area there that shows you the exact duplicate of the area that's on the left, so you can compare the craters and see if they are duplicate of each other. The one on the left took place 42 years ago. This pictures on the right took place in the last two years. Okay, we've been descending. Uh, I should tell you, you'll hear the crewmen talking. My, they're my co-pilot giving altitude and, and descent rates, and you'll hear people in the background uh, talking from mission control on Earth. We've been descending uh, about 2,000 meters a minute. We're now down to uh, about below 1,000 meters in altitude. Uh, you the, my... My, uh, com my computer tells me that we're, it's taking us to a landing just on the right side of that big crater on the, up in the up left-hand corner. The slopes are steep and the rocks look very large, the size of automobiles, certainly not a place that I want to land. So I took over manually from the computer, the autopilot, and flew it like a helicopter on out to the west to try to find a smoother, more level landing spot. The computer is complaining now and then. You'll hear caution alarms, 1202s and 1201s, which uh, is telling us the computer is a little bit concerned about its operation, but everything looks good, and the people in mission control tell us we can continue. Okay, we're about to... 100 meters above the sort of looking down at this 30 meter crater about eight meters deep looks like a real geological trader uh, treasure I want to go back there and look at that if I ever get the chance while I'm on on my on, my, on foot we're looking for a, a smooth spot beyond that crater I see a smooth spot right up near the top of the screen it looks like that's a that's a good place to be and I'm running low on fuel I have less than two minutes of fuel Getting down below about 70 meters now. 50 meters, still looking good. In the left side, you will see in the old movie that the rocket engine is starting to kick up some dust, dust off, the, off the surface. Down and get a 30-second fuel running. Need to get it down on the ground here pretty soon before we run out. Okay. It's, the, the picture on the left is more accurate, but there's more dust. There you see the shadow of my landing leg coming on, on the surface on the blowing dust. We're very close to the, the surface right now. Contact right. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Neil, that's amazing. And to have you actually commentate through it uh, in a relaxed state, far more relaxed than you would have been 42 years ago, is just very, very special. So, Neil, since those days of, those wonderful days of being an astronaut, you've had a, a long and successful career since that's included being a professor at university, uh, chairman of a large fortune company, uh, a series of chairmanships around um, issues to do with aerospace and all sorts of things. How difficult was it or how easy was it to transition your life from the first 40 being so focused and so deep in their drive to the next 40 years? Well, the subject matter has always been similar. I'm an uh, engineer by nature and uh, throughout uh, these years I've been dealing with engineering subjects and I always uh, feel fascinated by 
whatever it is we're looking into uh, from an engineering st standpoint. I have to say that now and then I miss uh, the excitement of, uh, of being in, in, the, uh, in the cockpit of an airplane and, and doing new things, but uh, I, I've come to uh, accept that and, uh, and found a, a lot of satisfaction in uh, solving problems uh, outside, outside of the aircraft. And in terms of this year, of course, is a wonderful celebration anniversary of, of the landing. And in and around the same time, NASA's made some rather sad, certainly from Australia's point of view, and I'm sure from the US's point of view, sad statements about what its plans are for the future. How are you feeling about that? Well, I, I, I'm substantially concerned about uh, the policy directions of the space agency, which are in fact directed by directed by the administration uh, and uh, we have a situation in the states where the uh, where the executive branch and the legislative branch the the white house and the congress are at odds over what the future direction should be and so they're sort of playing a, a, a game and nasa is the shuttlecock they're they're hitting back and forth as both sides try to get to nasa on the proper path so I, I, along with uh, many of my colleagues, have interjected ourselves into these discussions and uh, presented our perspectives to uh, the American people through newspaper editorials and to the Congress through testimony and, and hearings and to the administration by correspondence that we are trying to, uh, to uh, get on the very best path here. I, I think uh, that we've made some progress, but there's much yet to be done, and uh, I'll, I'll continue to interject myself into those roles. Because this battle, and uh, I've mentioned to you before when I'm in the US, I'm stunned by the instant news world that's been created there, the short-term thinking. Something like a NASA project, if you look at what it did to you as a country in the 60s, would give you something to aim for that's beyond tomorrow, you know, beyond just tomorrow, and almost re redefine the, the country again and give it vision? Well, in addition to that, uh, NASA has been one of the most successful mm. public investments in motivating students to do well and, uh, and achieve all they, they can achieve. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, sad that uh, we, are, we are turning the program in a direction where it will, will reduce the amount of motivation and stimulation that it provides to young people. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's a major concern to me. And that's never a good thing to do, but at this time in the US, and so that we wish you very well with that challenge. And if there's anything we can do nationally to help, you just call me. Thank you. I'll do I, my bit. I will, I will certainly do that. It's your message that is so profound, Neil. And I, and I do want to say to you at a, at a, at a personal level, you know, I, I, I made some effort to come to meet you to ask you to come to Australia. I did it ostensibly because your courage, with, along with your colleagues, your vision, your, your president of that time and everyone was such an exemplar of what we could do as, as, as a human race. And you did that, you, you, you then became a very, you stayed a very humble man and there is so much you need to keep talking about to ensure that leaders of today actually see what it's like to be a leader. I know you don't like talking about yourself, so that's why I'm doing it, <laughs> but you really do have an extraordinarily important role in, in the next 20 years. And I, so convinced am I that, that that's the case, that I will fly with you on a glider on your 100th birthday, because I know you still do that. That's right. the risk I'm willing to take, because <laughs> you have much work to do. Neil Armstrong, you're a wonderful man. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Neil Armstrong, the courage, the vision, the process drive, the capability, the belief, the dream, we weren't going to miss out in having Neil Armstrong speak at our 125th anniversary. It was like sitting with my father, telling me stories about his life with such enormous humility, humility I'd never seen before. There were a whole series of special moments, but no bigger for, for me than when we were saying goodbye to him at the airport, and I had a couple of security guys who were slightly larger than me, and uh, as Neil walked towards the gate, he turned around and saluted to the three of us, and I sort of put my arms around these very sizeable fellows and said, boys, that was for us, and that was, that was a great moment.
We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind.